Well, we're very pleased now to be welcoming to the Stanford's Travel Writers Festival writer and political analyst Nanjala Nyabala in conversation with Julia Wheeler. Hello, and let me add my welcome, a very warm welcome to the Stanford's Travel Writers Festival to this event. Thank you for finding us. Thank you for being here. Thank you for walking this journey with us. Um, today, I'm delighted to say that we are joined by Nanjala Nyabala, um, who is uh, joining us actually from Nairobi in Kenya. So wonderful to have you here um, to talk about your book, which is Travelling While Black. Um, this is a book of such depth, Nanjala. Um, I mean, it looks at the serious issues. It has your lived experience and your responses to that. And also there's plenty of humour along the way. Um, congratulations on it. You say very early on in the book, I think actually on the, the, the first line, this is not a travel memoir. I wonder how you would describe it. Um, thank you and thank you for having me. Um, that's actually a great question. I think I would really just describe it um, as an exploration of the idea of human beings in motion and whether those human beings are myself uh, or other people. It's really just, I wanted to really play around with this whole idea of uh, human beings, you know, the assumption that human beings are supposed to be grounded in one place and that home is supposed to be a fixed place. And to contrast that with the idea of human beings who are constantly in motion and the reality of the fact that we are constantly in motion, whether we are travelers, whether we are migrants, whether we are refugees, whether we are fleeing something, whether we are running towards something, or whether we are just being unsettled by the idea of home. Because as a traveler myself, I've just always found this idea that everybody has to be from somewhere and has to belong somewhere and has to be inevitably bound to one place. I've just always found it to be very difficult. I think that um, movement and human movement has always just been part of the human story. That's what makes our cultures rich. That's what makes our cultures um, complex. And so um, it was it, it was really, it, the essay collection for me was really about, about those ideas sort of pushing and pulling back against those ideas. And you've used your um, experience and your working experience, uh, working with displaced people um, and being an advocate for those people. Um, you draw huge distinctions, as we all must, between people who have the luxury of being able to choose to travel and those who are traveling through need. Mm -hmm. Yes, and I think it's important because there's a lot of similarities and there's also a lot of difference. Um, for example, just the idea of having somewhere that you can go back to um, changes the stakes and changes the choices that you're able to make. And for example, I include one essay about the whole experience of being bullied by a consular officer at one of the embassies here in Nairobi, being able to stand up for myself and being able to say, well, actually, I'm going to take my passport back and I don't need this kind of humiliation is a luxury that a lot of people don't have. Um, there are many people who in that position would have to accept that kind of humiliation, would have to accept that kind of um, um, degradation. And, and I think a lot of people don't realize how common that is. And they don't realize how travelers from certain national backgrounds are actually subjected to routine humiliation at, at embassies around the world. Um, just because they happen to have the nationality of the country in question and um, you know being made to sleep in the streets um, overnight while applying for visas um, being able being told to having your visa rejected um, on various grounds you know you didn't put the comma in the right place or the name in your passports is one letter different from the name that is um, on the form like little things like that and, and this kind of ritual humiliation is actually very common um, in, in the world and so that is part of the, the, the reason why I kept stories like that in there is that if you have the luxury of, of, of having a home, a place that you can go back to, your interpretation of what is possible is actually very different from the person who has left everything behind and is trying to search for that sense of home that gives you that sense of confidence. I, I'm just While you were speaking, I was just thinking actually about some of my own experience, which is a, a, a microcosm of that, perhaps. I, I lived for many years in the Middle East in Dubai and was always conscious that I could come back to Britain um, and that that would be fine and that I would pick up on, you know, whatever it was, even though I would have liked to have stayed. But I think if you come from a country where 
um, perhaps you can you you can go back to, but the situation there, if you do, would be very different. It actually puts you in a very different position within the society, the society that you've chosen for the moment to join, doesn't it? It absolutely does, and I think um, more. I include the quote by Watson Shira because I, I feel like she said something for the ages. You know, no one leaves home unless home is the mouth of a shark. Um, I think that traveling with the notion of seeing and exploring and coming back and, and experiencing and coming back is very different from, you know, giving up uh, everything and grabbing whatever you can get your hands on and, and running across the border. Or even if you're just looking around your society and you're seeing that there's no future and there's no opportunities and you can't be the full expression of yourself in your society, um, that also is a very different experience. And I think, yeah, we, we, we who have places that have not rejected us have to be the starting point of the conversation on empathy. We have to be the bridge that helps people who maybe haven't traveled as much and haven't experienced multiculturalism as much and haven't experienced other places as much. We have to be the starting point of empathy um, for people who are leaving under different circumstances for months and will still have the same um, intense experiences, fear, uh, hunger, confusion, um, you know, culture shock, but layered on top of that with the anxiety of not having a sense of home anywhere in the world, having lost the place that they called home. So that's kind of part of the, the broader um, idea behind this book is using myself as a person who knows the disorientation of travel, but admittedly from a place of relative privilege to try and be that bridge of empathy of, well, you know, if it's this intense for someone who on paper um, is a quote unquote good traveler. Can you imagine how intense it is for a person who is fleeing conflict and who has left everything behind? Let, let's talk about asylum. And you mentioned Wasan Shire um, and her poem, Home. Um, I would uh, really ask everybody to, to go and search for that poem. It's freely available on the internet. Um, and it really does encapsulate what that must feel like. Um, I guess this is one of the wonderful things that having an online festival, as well as Nistling, you can actually uh, go and do a, a search at the same time and, and um, bring in that information as well, or, or perhaps afterwards. But, but really, really, I, I would, would recommend that poem. So one of the chapters in your book is called The End of Asylum. Um, while we're on the, the, the mm. subject of, of migration and so on. Um, I, I wonder whether you'd sort of paint that landscape for us in terms of how things have changed and how we've got to where we are now with attitudes towards asylum. Yeah, um, I think a lot of people around the world have started to take the right to asylum, the right to asylum for granted and are forgetting the reason why the right to asylum was created. And it's not ancient history. I mean, we're talking about the end of the Second World War. We're talking about millions of people across Europe and around the world. You know, the Second World War was primarily fought in Europe, but it was also fought in other parts of the world. You know, Germany and Britain fought in East Africa and in West Africa and in parts of Asia. And so the right to asylum was basically this recognition that if we didn't build a fail safe into the way in which we respond to conflict that would allow people to flee and find people who are not involved, civilians who are not involved in conflict can find safety and can start again, then we are condemning millions of people to near certain death. And that's why I gave the example of that ship, you know, that left with 256 people, left Germany with 256 uh, Jewish uh, refugees on board and stopped by many different countries trying to find safety for these 256 people and no country would take them in. And when the boat went back, most of them were killed. These are not abstract experiences. And these are some of the things that are starting to repeat themselves. But at the same time, because people have lost that sense of history, um, the right to asylum is under constant siege. So whether you have countries that are building physical walls to keep people out, and we know about the United States because it's the most horrendous, it's, it's the most egregious example, right? Because this is the richest country in the world, but it's not the only country that's building walls. Even my country, Kenya, is building a wall with Somalia in order to keep Somali refugees out. Uh, Morocco is building a wall um, with Western Sahara. Um, there are so many countries around the world that are building physical walls to keep people out. And, and 
Um, and, and, and you have, you know, ideological walls, what's happening in the Mediterranean Sea, you know, allowing boats to drown, um, what's happening in the English Channel, that shift in resources, that enhanced policing, that criminalization, that's all part of the same thing that's happening, which is undermining this idea that if people need safety, countries that have possibility of providing that safety should first provide the safety and then decide afterwards, okay, well, is this um, is this person um, is this a person who maybe misrepresented their case? Is this a person who maybe needs to be processed differently? Like we need to unpack, we need to sort of tear down um, this growing um, fortress mentality that's taken over the way we think about our borders and our societies. Because what's happening is the criminalization of asylum is condemning people to death. The criminalization of just seeking that help, that seeking that safety, is actually condemning people to death. And you, you, it's not, it's not ethically, um, uh, it's not grounded on any sort of objective. There is no invasion. If every single person, I, I read the statistic once, that if every single person who was trying to get into Europe right now managed to get into Europe, it would raise the population of Europe by one percent. Like most people are not really trying to flee their homes. Most people are not, even, even people who are migrating for school or for uh, work, they're not trying to leave their homes permanently. I think we should perhaps say that um, the, the declaration for, uh, the, U, the UN Declaration of Human Rights talks about seeking asylum, but it doesn't say anything about granting asylum. And I wonder whether you might answer that question alongside the idea that I must admit was new to me or I forgot it had been lost in the mists of time about the Schengen system which within Europe has provided lots of freedom between borders but you point out that actually if, if you're not from Europe the, the very opposite has happened. Yeah yeah absolutely and I and that's part of the reason why I wanted to write that essay and put myself in this conversation because I think that a lot of people in Europe when they say things like, why don't they just come, you know, the regular way? Why don't they just come through the airport? Don't understand how difficult and complex coming through the airport has become. And I say this, you know, like as a person who, you know, travels a great deal and has lived in Europe and has been in and out of Europe frequently, that even for people who have um, on paper, check all the boxes. It is still a very grueling and difficult and expensive exercise. It still means a full day of sitting at the embassy waiting to drop off your application. It still means if, you're, if the embassy is not in your country, it still means sometimes an international flight to go to the country that, where the embassy is represented. It still means providing you know, all kinds of documentation that many people don't have. And so the, that's the first thing is that people need to recognize that um, the trade-off between creating this system of free movement um, within Europe and raising the fortress, raising the walls of the fortress has actually been very high. And, and it doesn't have to be that high, right? Like it could actually be, you know, some of the ideas I put forward in the book, if, you, if, if you're doing this as a public service, do you have to charge this much money for people to do it? If it's something that you're saying is integral to the survival of the, of the region, then do it as a public service, take it as a, as a thing. But like people are, are losing um, their lives and losing money and losing time and losing all of these things because the walls of the fortress are getting higher and higher. Um, and, and yeah, there, there is a right to seek asylum. There is not a right to grant asylum. But what we've done is we've eroded even the right to seek asylum. And this is part of the issue that I wanted to put on the table that, you know, the people who are dying in the Mediterranean Sea are not even being allowed to seek asylum. The people who are being holed up in cages in, you know, across the border in, in the United States, even here in Kenya, the people who are being forcefully returned in, to Somalia. And I, they, you know, I, I don't just, write a book that is just saying, well, you know, everything that's bad in the world is happening in Europe, because this is a global problem. South Africa, with, you know, with Zimbabweans and Kenyans, with Zimbabwe, this is a global problem that's embedded in the contemporary logic of statehood. And, and so even that right to seek asylum has been eroded significantly um, by this decision to sacrifice um, or to allow you know people to die 
in order to preserve um, this notion of this this idea of the strong state or the the, the strength of the state is at the border and things like that. So um, I don't know if I've answered your question, um, but yeah, I think I think I think that's kind of where we're going with all of this um, highly securitized border practice. And again, it's not just in Europe. I think it's something about the way in which we're starting to imagine what the point of statehood is. Mm. Let's take you on one of your journeys um, to Haiti, where, uh, which is where you went um, in, a, in a sort of professional role. Tell us what you were doing there, uh, what you found there, and also interestingly, why you called the chapter, I am not white. Yeah, um, because this is a thing that I wanted to, um, so Haiti is an amazing country. It took a second for me to get into how amazing Haiti it was. Um, and I, I point out some of the challenges in the book. It, it took a while, but by the time I left, I was completely in love with the island and, and completely in love with the history and the rich history and trying to really figure out what the relationship could be between you know, myself as an African and Haiti as part of the African diaspora. Um, and I call the ch ch chapter that because people kept struggling. People really struggled. Um, and this is not a Haitian thing. This is really a global thing. Because when I go to South Asia, I also have this weird experience. I think our conversations on race can get so quickly stuck on the black, white as a physical thing, um, when actually it's actually a much more complicated story than that. I think race is a construction or no, there are biological reasons, but there's also like a social construction that also needs to be interrogated, which is this idea of, of otherness and this idea of privilege and this idea of having things and, and having access to things that people don't have. And I think that for me, what I've experienced is this idea that because of being different and because of coming from a place, I went to Haiti as a second year student at Harvard Law School. And that brought with it a certain measure of opportunity and, and people thought I had more money than I did. I didn't have that much money, but people thought I had more money than I actually did. And, um, and kept saying this to me, you know, blank, saying, well, you are, but not to mean white, to mean privileged, to mean that you have, it's, it's not like a one-to-one -one literal translation. And for me, that kind of set me off on this intellectual journey of, of starting to, to think a little bit about what it says, why we construct this idea of race and why different societies have different ideas of race and different societies have different ideas of, of hierarchy. And, and so we, when people talk about, um, for example, when people talk about white supremacy, I think you lose sight of the fact that we're not just talking about the person who is in front of me. We're talking about this is social constructions that go into building this, these systems. We're talking about the choices and the decisions that go into, you know, this person is a criminal and this person is a terrorist and this person is not a terrorist. This person is a criminal and this person. That's not just about a one-to-one -one thing about the color of the person's skin. It's about social choices. And really, it, because I was still in operating in the criminal law space at the time, it really fed into how I was thinking about this stuff more globally. It was like, um, why do we need to build these things? You know, I've always been the kind of person who puzzles about uh, why. I don't, it's not always just about, you know, it was a really annoying child. It's not always just about the thing that's in front of you, but also why. Why do I have to do this? Why do I... And so that's kind of why I wanted to have that essay is it's not enough to just say that, for example, the border logic um, is racist, but to understand racism as a social construction, we have to start to see it where it starts to fall apart. And so for me, Haiti is where it started to fall apart and it started to show itself as something that is invented and, and has very specific social functions. Um, and um, yeah, I, I, I think it's also really important, or it was, it was important for me, and I think it's important for a lot of people from Africa and from the African diaspora to see each other and to mix and to see each other directly because 
um, it was, we were not, for the first couple of weeks, we were not talking about each other, myself and the Haitian people that I met. We were talking about ideas that we had about each other. We were, you know, re referring to each other as, as um, that what we had consumed in the news and what we had consumed in the press and everything that you see about Haiti, whenever Haiti makes it to the mainstream news, it's always negative. And whenever Kenya makes it to the mainstream news, it's always negative. So they were struggling and I was struggling because I didn't fit what that structure was. I, uh, and so, and I, and Haiti didn't fit what the structure was. And so, yeah, I, for me, that whole experience, um, because I was still operating in this law space, got me really thinking about why we need, why we invent racial hierarchies, um, why we invent social different, why we invent a need for social differences, why we emphasize otherness, why we emphasize um, people, those people are this and these people are that. And, um, and I wanted to use that essay to say, well, actually, a, a lot of it's made up, B, a lot of it's not useful um, and, and does more harm than good. And, and C, a lot of it is very fluid and changes um, at the drop of a hat. So those are some of the ideas that I wanted to explore. You talk in that essay about um, a Saturday morning workshop that you set up, and I wonder how much you feel that your blackness in that situation, connecting with the people who you were um, working with, walking in the shoes of, um, was an asset. Um, yeah, I didn't set up the workshop. I feel like I should point that out. I didn't set up the workshop. I was just part of the workshop. Um, I was just helping out. Um, and I think what made it the asset was that it made it the bridges of empathy, the, the conversations that we were able to have. Um, these are very vulnerable young women. Um, young women, young women is an example. They were girls. Um, and they were young girls who had survived sexual assault and who were using this workshop as an opportunity to come together and to learn new skills, but also to just be in solidarity because like in many others, this was after, so after the 2010 earthquake in Haiti, a lot of families ended up in what they're called tent cities. So they were displaced, they lost their homes and they moved into these informal camps called tent cities. And the rates of sexual assault, especially young, around young girls were incredibly high in the 10 cities. And a lot of the young women, uh, young girls, um, because everybody knows everybody else, right? It's a very tight space. There's a lot of stigma that comes with sexual assault. And I, I and this is not a, a Haitian, I mean, I just think about this, like why in the world, in most societies, the stigma rests on the person who has been assaulted and not the person who did the assaulting. But um, it, it, that's the world in which we live in. And so a lot of the young girls, you know, they lose friends, they lose that sense of um, community. And so that's what the workshop does. It tries to restore a sense of community, it tries to restore a sense of um, pride and, and self in the young girls. And so I showed up at the workshop and I think what happens is that it makes it easier for people, for the young women to see that this is something that they can, um, this is someone who they can almost, not necessarily aspire to, but you know, sort of um, be like. Um, and I don't wanna say aspire to, because like, they don't know who I am and they don't know my background. They just see someone who's in a position of authority who looks like them and who is able to to engage with them um, and who's able to, you know, tell stories with them and sit with them and be with them. And it feeds into this broader conversation about representation. I think people who are accustomed to seeing themselves, you know, on television and in popular culture and whatever, don't know what it is to not have something, not have a, 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 a figure that you can aspire to, that you can connect with in that way. Like, I think it's, it's, easy to take for granted that the world um, or that the world sees you when you're 
you're very well represented in popular culture. But for most of the world's population, that's just not, that just doesn't happen um, and the way we would like. And so it's kind of like a microcosm of that. Um, and, and it was funny because they really, it was just, for me, it was just one of those really life-changing experiences to be embraced in such uh, an unambiguous way, but also to be able to connect in such a human way. And, and I learned much, so much from those workshops. I hope that someone learned something from me, but I definitely learned a great deal about empathy and advocacy and what it means to be an empathetic advocate without necessarily taking on the trauma of the people that you're working, you're working for. Um, yeah, and I think that was it. It was really that, oh my gosh, here's a person who has come from the other side of the world um, and looks like me, but is so different from me and is coming in a position of authority. I think kids need that. I think kids need um, people that they can empathize with um, to help them sort of start to build their own frameworks of aspiration. Um, there's so much self-awareness in your book. And one of the things that you say uh, at one point is that you are a, a sort of walking cliche for travel in that, you know, you've gone somewhere to um, do good, you know, do good work to help, etc. But actually, it's you that learns the most. Uh, it's you that's helped the most, um, rather than the, the, the people that you uh, that you went to meet. Yeah. And I, I really wanted... Um, to pin that also for myself. I just really wanted to pin that feeling somewhere. Um, because I think we, I don't know whether it's Marvel or the DC comics or whatever brand, um, cartoon, superhero, um, especially when you work in advocacy and, and you're trying to be a quote unquote, a good person, you get, in, you get sort of inundated by this idea of the superhero mentality that I'm gonna go in, I'm gonna swoop in and I'm gonna, um, help everyone and then they're going to give me the Nobel Prize and everything's going to be fantastic. And I wanted to make it clear that I don't think that other people suffer so that we can have life lessons. I don't think that, for example, you know, um, holding up disabled people and saying, oh, well, you know, or when people do that thing where they say, um, you know, eat all your greens because there are children in Africa who don't have food. I think that's terrible. I don't think that the point of other people suffering is so that we who have more um, can feel good about ourselves. But I do think um, um, at the same time, I do think that if we are open to being in communion and in partnership with the societies um, that we claim to advocate for and to work for, that we can actually learn so much from each other. And, and that requires being very conscious, like you said, being very self-aware of who you are, how you will be perceived, what you will be able to do, the scope of work that you will be able to do because of the way that you are perceived. And being able to walk away from a lot of privilege and being able to, because if you're there as an advocate, you're necessarily coming with a lot of privilege. And so to be able to walk away from that and say, you know, um, I am here to walk with you. I'm here to build with you. I'm here to, to I don't know, build a better world with you. Um, I think for me, that's the future of this whole space and the advocacy space and the, you know, I, I think that the superhero model of swooping in and, and you know, living separate from the people that you're claiming to help, I think it's, it's days are numbered. Um, and I was trying to sort of get people who, and that essay was especially for people who work in this advocacy space, um, to really start to see the human side of what are we actually doing and what are we not able to do because we are um, embracing this other model. I hope I'm answering your question. <laughs> You absolutely are. It's absolutely it's, it's fascinating, fascinating. As, as I say, there's so much in this book for lots of different audiences. Um, in terms of the, the travel side, I, I can really feel a fondness uh, within the book for Burkina Faso, um, which was a kind of random trip for you, wasn't it? And, and the start of a lot of random trips. Tell us why you love that country so much. Yeah. I think. You know, I always say to people, you know, I don't think that people 
like New York City. I think people like how New York City makes them feel. I think it makes them feel like um, they can be, you know, cultural and they can be whatever. And, and, and so I think for me, a lot of Burkina Faso's, the love that I have for Burkina Faso is, is for how it made me feel. It was the first time that I had traveled alone. It was the first time that I had taken a spontaneous trip. It was the first time that I sort of kept pushing myself and pushing myself and being rewarded for that. I keep pushing my boundaries and being rewarded for that. And it was the first time that I felt that I really started to come into my own as, as a traveler because I had been to other places before. I was living in the UK at the time. I, I had been to the Czech Republic. I had been in Togo, I had been in Ghana, but it was the first time that I had really started to figure out what my travel style was and what my, by extension, what my approach to the world was. And um, it just was a, it confounded so many of the things that I thought I knew about both Burkina Faso and the world. It made me stop and, and reassess how I was consuming information about the world. And it didn't just stop with traveling. It has become part of my um, broader work as a researcher and as a writer. It's become part of how I think about life and, and existence. And that's why I write essays about, well, you know, reimagining asylum policy and reimagining the idea of home, all that begins with this trip where everything that I thought I knew was completely um, upturned and what stood in this place was so much better than anything I could ever have imagined. And it breaks my heart to see what's happening in Burkina Faso right now because I, have, I am not sure I have ever known that much kindness and hospitality and welcome and, and you know, just really open arms. Um, I'm not sure that I've ever known that anywhere else. And, and of course, a lot of that is also that it's, it was my first trip, my first experience. So everything is kind of heightened and everything feels very intense and technicolor, but um, it really breaks my heart that such an amazing and singular place that represents so much history and so much, you know, I talk about the, the, the market in Gorom Gorom. I mean, that's one of the oldest trading posts on the Trans-Saharan um, trade network, which goes back to the 16th century, um, um, you know, and, and you can't even go there now because of um, this insurgency and because of this global, you know, uh, terrorism crisis and things like that. So, yeah, um, I think it's, it's, it's a, it was for me, it, and I think it was it, for a lot of people, a really beautiful place, a really unique place and a really singular place that we are losing to uh, these global um, political shifts. And, and social shifts. And, and so that's part of the reason why I, I centered so much on it because I think it's so easy to lose that whole thing that this is the place. It's not just a point on a map, but it's a place that has people who live there and have lived there and have been doing this stuff and, and are, you know, it's, it's not just a point on a map. Yeah. Mm. I learned from your book that the the, um, the translation, if you like, of Burkina Faso is "land of honest men," which I thought was absolutely gorgeous. And and listening to what you were saying there, I think perhaps so many people who are, who are watching will have that similar experience in whichever country it was that is really really formative for them. And as you say. Um, perhaps channels later attitudes and, and so on and so forth and that they look back to you know so, so very fondly um, so I let, let's talk about fear though not the fear that you know obviously mm -hmm. it's very difficult to go to you know faster now and, and you wouldn't do that but just generally um, in t travel um, you know it can be fearful it, it, you are being intrepid you are going mm -hmm. out there and you are seeing new things Let's talk about the fear and also the empowerment that overcome overcoming that fear can really bring yeah. to you through travel. Yeah, 
Um, that essay on fear and travel really is probably one of the most personal essays in the collection. And I wanted to, to have it because it has really, oh, learning how to manage, using travel to learn how to manage fear has really changed my life. And it has also changed how I work and it has changed how I think and it has changed how I, I move through the world. And fear really can be a very paralyzing thing. And, and we, we, you know, children come into this world completely unafraid and they climb trees and they run around and they eat everything and they do everything. And then over time, we, the adults, we try and teach, we teach them fear and we teach them not just fear of things, but also fear of places and fear of concepts and fear of difference and fear of everything. Like um, we project our negative experiences and we project the negative experiences of other people onto our children and we, we teach them how to make their world smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. Because I mean, rightfully so, we're trying to make sure that they survive. Um, but some of the fears that we teach children um, impede globally our ability to live together on this planet and to share the planet and to be better about the way in which we interact with the planet. And we teach people to be afraid of far, children to be afraid of faraway places. And we, we use faraway places as kind of like a specter of uh, punishment. And, you know, um, and, and we make the people who live in those places like an abstract thing. You know, when you tell people about Iraq, people don't think about Iraqis. They think about the war in Iraq. They think about the crisis in Iraq. They don't think about people who wake up every morning and go to the market and go to school and, you know, go to work and, and have people that they love. And so one of the things that travel has really taught me is how to put fear in its rightful place. And that doesn't mean that I, you don't get afraid. It means don't, not letting the fear outrun you, not letting the fear become so big that you end up not doing the thing that um, you want to do or you're curious about or not looking up or reaching out to the people that you're interested in and the people that you are um, curious about. And fear in travel really starts to present obstacles about, you know, where we will go, who we will talk to. I have two essays that I write about Nairobi because Nairobi is one of those places where outsiders will come in and will be given a long list of places. Don't go here, don't go there, don't talk to these people, don't do this, don't do this. Because someone else had an experience, you know, 20 years ago. And so that place is definitely a no-go. And, and so what I really hope people take from that essay is that fear in, in and of itself represents a human um, response to newness that is not in and of itself a bad thing. What is important is to put it in its rightful place. Don't let it paralyze you. Don't let it overtake you. Don't let it constrain what you think um, you can do and be in the world. And that is a lesson from travel that I have taken into my professional life. People are always like, well, what do you do? Well, you know, if I were a person who was overtaken by my fear, I would have narrowed down the scope of what I do a long time ago and just done you know, the safe thing and taken the safe route. But learning how to put that fear of the unknown in its proper place means an orientation, openness to risk, an openness to possibility, and an openness to newness. One of my very favorite chapters in your book um, is about Bessie Head, the South African novelist. Um, I wonder whether you can yeah. um, share the stories really of how you found her both on the page and your pilgrimage to find out more about her on land. Um, Bessie Head is uh, an icon of African writing and is an icon of African writing that doesn't get the respect and I think the adulation that she deserves. Uh, in many parts of the world, the idea of the African writer, when you ask for African writers, people all go to the men first. They go to Chino Achebe, Wallace Rinka, and so the idea of the African writer has been stuck in this box of malehood for so many years. And so the experiences that I had with encountering Bessie Head are basically a process of trying to get out of that box. That um, e even here in Africa, we are taught great African literature, and the list is you get to like number 11 or 12 before the women's name starts to pop up. And so what I wanted 
what I, when I encountered Bessie Head, it was again a process of unlearning. It was a process of trying to get out of the box that I had been put in. And then came this desire to connect and this desire to actually understand this person better. And when the opportunity opened up to go and, and read her letters and, and understand who she was behind the pen, I, I jumped at it. Because I think there's a lot of, um, there can be a lot of mystery around who writers are and what motivates them and, and who they are. And, and so, and it's, it's very rare, especially for African writers to have such a comprehensive, like every single letter that she wrote over this 20, 30 year period is in this archive. I mean, that's astounding. It's, it's not common at all and will be less common now with the internet because people are not going to die and say, well, here's my email password, go and read all the letters I've ever written. Um, so, and, and what I found in the archive was really a tortured artistic soul who managed, still managed to preserve a sense of awe and um, dignity, not just in herself, but in the people that she was writing about. I say this in the book, I've said it always, and I'll keep saying it until the day that I die. I've never read anybody who has written so beautifully about rural Africa with such compassion and such dignity and such respect and such humanity and not really, and, 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 and so completely. And, um, and it was reflected in the way that she lived, but also, you know, the world really, really um, treated Bessie Head unfairly. And I, another reason why I wanted to have that essay in there was because Bessie Head was stateless. Bessie Head left South Africa under the apartheid rules and uh, um, as a result had to give up her South African citizenship but the Botswana government did not give her citizenship for 15 years. And the question that I want the reader to take from that is who else, which other genius is stuck in a refugee camp somewhere, in a boat somewhere? What other forms of genius are being lost in these ways in which we think about statehood and citizenship and identity? Who else is writing these amazing novels and amazing poems in a camp somewhere and they're not getting read and and you know people the figurative question what if the cure for cancer is inside the mind of a person who's languishing in a refugee camp somewhere so that was another reason why i wanted that essay but to show this enormous mind and creative spirit and human you know extraordinary human being who for 15 years had to go to the police station every Monday, report to the police station every Monday because she was stateless. And that ravaged, the way that ravaged her body, her mind, her creative spirit. So um, that's, that's, an, that's part of the reason why I wanted to pay homage to her, but also to remind people that genius doesn't just come from Oxbridge and, and Harvard and, and you know, in a nice, neat, tidy package. Sometimes it's in a stateless person and in a refugee person and in a, in a rural village somewhere, um, just waiting for the world to be, catch up and be ready to listen. She wrote a number of novels, but I wonder whether there's just one that if people are thinking that sounds fascinating, is a good introduction to Bessie Head <laughs> that you'd pick. Don't make me pick do between my more? children. <laughs> you have to read the book. Uh, don't make me pick between my children. Um, I would say two, uh, Maru and When Rain Clouds Gather. Then you can read all of the other ones subsequently. But if you must start with two, it's Maru and, and When Rain Clouds Gather. They're very short, so you can actually read them both um, in like a weekend or something. But, um, but I'm not going to pick one. I will stop at two. Fair enough. And it sounds as if once we've read those, we, it, we'll be hooked just, just like you. Um, Mandela, thank you so much for, for being here. It's, as I say, it's a wonderful book. Um, we haven't even got onto the chapter entitled wonderfully, The Place is Your Pea. Um, but we will have to leave that and people will have to buy the book in order to, um, to, to find out what that's all about because that, uh, yeah, that is a laugh out loud chapter. So thank you for that chapter. Thank yeah. you for all of it. Thank you for being here. Um, everybody, um, I, please go to the Stanford's bookshop, have a look for this book, uh, flick through it, as it were, in, in terms of the, 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 um, 
the uh, the back cover and so on. But you've heard so much about it here. I do hope that it's, it's whetted your appetite. Um, thank you very much for watching. Nangela, thank you for joining us. Thank you for writing the book. Thank and you. thank you for an absolutely fascinating discussion. Thank you very much. Thanks thank for having me. Thank you, Nanjala, and to Julia too. Uh, well, if your nervous bladder needs advice, it seems Nanjala's on hand to dispense. Travelling Wild Black is available to buy now at stanfords.co.uk. Uh, really interesting, I thought, to hear of the effects of Schengen on those seeking asylum. Uh, if I've learnt one thing from my involvement with the Stanford's Travel Writers Festival over the past six years, it's that travel breaks down boundaries. And hearing all of these first-hand experiences is a wonderful way to continue that discovery without even boarding a plane. So do fish through our archive of podcast recordings from previous year's events and enjoy the many other authors' conversations from this year's Stanford's Travel Writers' Festival.